our story too far. Okay. Can everybody hear and see? Let us know in the chat. Okay. Can you hear me? There we go. We are ready to rock and roll. We have Everybody's got. Good then. All right. <clears throat> we've got a presentation. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and go. Are you ready, Sir Fletcher? Yeah. Go ahead. All right. So tonight's tonight's discussion, uh, we're gonna talk about breaking into the business. Um, and in, to do so, I, I need to really sort of lay out some groundwork of how the business works. Now, when I say breaking into the business, I'm talking about Hollywood business. There's uh, There are a lot of options that can happen locally. There are a lot of options that, you know, within your own um, local film um, economy. And, and those, those are going to be quite a bit different than this. Um, this is really our discussion tonight is all about Hollywood and how, how it works and, and, and to give some tips on how to break in. So, um, and I call it the, uh, really the game of Hollywood cause it's kind of a, it's kind of a game essentially that you gotta, that you gotta, you really gotta play if you want to get in. Um, and, and you kind of got to know how it works. So my goal tonight is to give you an overview of how the whole system works, who the different players are and how they integrate and then how we, uh, really sort of, um how we can break in at the uh, levels coming out of high school or college um so let's go ahead and kick it off um in hollywood there are three separate players you've got producers um, agents and studios those are the three elements that really come to play when you're talking about hollywood it's the it's those three um, groups and each of those groups have um, individuals that are in those groups that are essentially running them. Um, so uh, I'm going to jump into the studios first and talk a little bit about the studios. With the studios there are majors and mini majors. The majors are just that, major film studios. So you've got DreamWorks, um, Walt Disney, Paramount, Columbia, you know, Warner Brothers, Universal, those are the majors. And then you have mini majors that that sort of every major probably has a mini major. Like 20th Century Fox has Fox Searchlight. And um, you know, Paramount has a um, um Paramount Vantage. I'm not sure if they're anyway, if they're around still or not, but it's it's really like that fox faith a lot of them have a faith um based mini major um you know universals is the major the mini major is focus and so uh, the division of those two are that the majors will essentially produce the major films the high budget films the mini majors are the ones that take on the the lesser um budget films but they all have you know, people that run them, obviously. So let me, and then you have producers. Producers are production companies and usually have a producer at the helm. Like you've got Jerry Mullen and then films that he produces. Um, you've got Brian, uh, Brian Grazier and Ron Howard at Imagine um, Entertainment and the films they produce. Well, there are hundreds, if not uh, thousands there are a lot of producers out there okay and they're all producing different movies uh, and uh, we'll get into that just a little bit more so then uh the, the third element are the agencies you have i've listed four major agencies which have creative artist agency uta icm and then william morrison endeavor they just uh well, not just a year or two ago um uh, merged and so it's William Morris Endeavor. So those are the four major agencies. So here's you've got those three elements that that pretty much run um, Hollywood. So they all have leverage. They all have different aspects of leverage. So we're going to talk a little bit about the leverage that each of them have um, so that we can then kind of understand 
how they all come together and combine and and rely on each other for their 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 pieces of the puzzle of the of this game of like a, what I like to call it. So producers producers have essentially the creativity, right? They've got the concepts, um, the creative concepts and the ideas, and then creativity. They're the ones that usually drive the creativity. They're the ones that foster it. They're the ones that develop a project and and to do the um, kind of get the projects going. The studios, they are the money. They're the banks and the agents represent the talent, which are actors, directors and writers. And so these three come together really as the Hollywood player and they all sort of cross over one another. So each of them have each of them have their area of influence and they work together in making of major motion pictures or mini major motion pictures or independence. So we didn't even list the independents, uh, but there's a bunch of independents out there too. So um, so continuing here, kind of setting it up. So you've got with the studio system. So now we got the studios and I want to talk a little bit about the studios and how they work and how they start to interact uh, with the other elements. So we talked about the studios and we, we got producers. So the way that happens is every studio has a producer or many producers, as you'll see here in a second. So Disney used to have, have since fired them. But just for this example, Disney used to have a, a producer deal with Jerry Bruckheimer or Jerry Bruckheimer had a studio deal. And so what that means is Jerry Bruckheimer, Disney would pay Jerry Bruckheimer's overhead to get to look at his films first because Jerry Bruckheimer has produced a lot of big films, made a lot of money and, and made a lot of money for, for Disney for that matter. And so every studio has a whole bunch of producers so if you if you recall when we were talking about the studios the the majors and the mini majors they all have producing deals uh, studio deals or producing deals producing deals with stu with um, producers and so i i'm just showing you here disney as one example and they have several producing um, deals, producer deals. Well, D uh, DreamWorks has the same thing. Fox has the same thing. Um, and, you know, Paramount has the same thing. They all have the same. So now the income, the agencies, and the agencies essentially, those are the four agencies that I talked about before. These four agencies, um, cater to the studios and the producers. And so the way they do that, well, the way they interact is by um, reaching out to the different producers for the different needs that they have. If you recall, um, let's see here. I just want to go back just for a second, maybe. Um, if you recall, the agents their leverage is actors and their leverage. And so when you the system, that act with these elements in the system. So an agency writers or actors or directors, they will be producers and be aware of these. for instance, CAA in this example aware that Jerry Bruckheimer has a project because remember he's the creative element he has a project that needs and so they this agent is reaching out to writers so Darren Fletcher the famous writer and CA I made it you made it CA is Darren Fletcher over to Jerry Bruckheimer to get that job to be the writer on the project Jerry is is producing. Why? Because they want Jerry Brown 
Kramer to hire Darren Fletcher because Darren Fletcher is paid a lot of money, right, Darren? Darren Fletcher is paid a lot of money to write, and guess what? Agents get 10% of that. So it's their job to be pushing Darren Fletcher or whatever writers to Jerry Bruckheimer or all these other creative forces that are pushing projects and creative and, and have attached them to studios, okay? So it might be a director, it might be an actor, it might be, you know, um, you know, those are above the line. It, it could be even a production designer, but we won't go into that. That really kind of compl complicates the map here a little bit. So that's what happens. They are producing, producers are producing projects because they are the creative force. They get them attached to studios, and then those pr specific projects have needs to have writers or directors. Now, we would like to be, if we're in high school or we're in college, we would like for our students or us as students to get jobs in Hollywood. If we, if I claim that I'm a director, then I want to figure out how to get in and be a director. If I'm a writer, I want to figure out how to get in. If I want to be a producer, how do I get into this system? Okay, so, so now we understand what the system is. We, that's how the studio system works. And now let's sort of take the producer track and we'll talk a little bit how all of this sort of comes together. Okay, so the track, producer's track, really all of them rely around building relationships with the players. Okay, so if there's one thing that I stress with young filmmakers, whether they're young writers or young producers or young directors, is to establish your network. OK, so you got to build relationships with the players. Who are the players? The players are the producers, the studio, the producers and the agents. You got to You got to establish your relationships with them. And then. You um, within the within that network of players, you got to establish your network. Sorry, you got to build relationships with the players and you got to establish the network. So how do we do that? Right. So we've got. Um, we have our goal is to get a network within this world that uh, that has all the power. So, what are the jobs? Okay, the jobs within each of these are producers. There's producers. There's executives. Like uh, there's senior VPs of creative. There's junior execs, and then there are assistants that really sort of cater to those to those junior execs, execs, and producers. Right. On the agency side, there are agents, there are junior agents, there are assistants that service the junior agents and the agents, and there's the mailroom that brings the mail around to everyone, right? Now, then there's the studios, the studio heads. You've got the studio heads, the presidents, the executives, the junior executives, and the assistants, right? So, which are the most important um, in this whole formula for what we're talking about today? It is. Oh, wait, hang on. Let me show you one more thing before we get into that. So I just wanted to add this here so you can kind of see that the agents represent talent, uh, actors, writers, and directors, right? Okay, so if you're an actor, writer, director, this is kind of where you're going to fall into this, into this formula. We're talking producers, though, right now, the path for producers. So producers... You know, where is the where is you know the place where you will land? Okay, well, I'm coming out of college and I'm I'm on the producer track, so I want to be a producer. So I'm going to go to Jerry Bruckheimer, and I'm going to tell Jerry Bruckheimer that I am a producer out of college. That's what I want to do, and I want to co-produce with him. Fletch, is that a great idea? Mm -mm. <laughs> it's not, it's no. not big, because is is Jerry Bruckheimer going to partner with me just coming out of college? Who? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's no reason for him to partner with me. Okay? So the most, the, the, you know, the place, the most important positions in this whole network here are these guys at the bottom of the rung, right? The mailroom, 
the assistance to the producers and the exec and the execs, the junior execs and the assistance to the junior execs. Those are the ones that are important, at least for us right now, because our goal is to build relationships with the players. How do we do that? We do that through establishing our network. And so we got to figure out how to get into this, this, these positions, right? Because that's that gets us in and involved with the, this network. Because the way it works, we talked about a little bit back with that other graphic, but the agents are always pushing, you know, content writers, directors, to producers, and to the studios. Okay, and then the studios and the producers are. Pushing, you know, looking to casting directors. I kind of added that one in there for you guys. That's that's another one. It's not, I wouldn't consider it one of the players, but it's an element that's that's playing into it because actors kind of get pushed to casting directors. But with writers and directors, it's going back and forth um, to the, the producers and the studios. So the producers may request from the agents, we are looking for writers, right? So that's that's how this whole thing is start kind of kind of moves. Okay. So back to this image. So we have Jerry Bruckheimer representing this one producer deal. Okay. Now there's another producer here deal here, which is uh, Brigham Taylor. He's another producer. Brigham Taylor was um, was the I guess he wasn't on the producing end. He was on the studio end when he did the Pirates of the Caribbean. But now he's a producer for Disney. And in his recent credits, Fletch, what was his recent credits? The um, um, his recent credits, uh, Christopher Robin, Christopher Robin. I can't hear you, Fletch, if you're talking to me. So it's Christopher Robin um, was his most recent. He's worked on Mothers for the studio. So each one of these little bubbles, as I mentioned, has is represents a producer, one of the many producers that we talked about in the beginning. Okay, remember this list here? So these producers are all attached to, uh, we're talking about one studio right now, one studio. Okay, so one studio is has got, I don't know, they may have 10 to 20 producer deals depending on how big the studio is. If it's a, a mini major, then they might have less. But each of those producers and each of those agents and each of those studios have assistance, right? So we talked about assistance. So each of those have assistants that are working crazy. and helping to get the work done, right? So everyone in the studio, there's executives at all the studios level. They all have assistants. All the producers have assistants. All the agents have assistants. And so that is the level that we want to be coming in at as we're coming out of college. We want to come in and be assistants. Now, why in the world do we want to come in and be assistants? Really, because we can't. If you want to play in this big world, then you got to start at the bottom. If if we're playing in our in our local industry, then then it's a little different because we can come in as a director and we can direct smaller commercials, we can do things like that. Wedding videos, we can we can come in at a bit of a higher level, but if we're trying to get into the studio system, it's the best part is the 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 fastest way to go or the fastest way to getting a job is coming in at the bottom level so if you're coming in as on the agency route okay and you want to be in the agents uh, become an agent then you start in the mailroom if you want to go and work at dreamwork or disney or any of the any of the major studios then you become an assistant somewhere or in their mailroom. Um, and and then producers, um, it's a little easier to get in with producers because they're they have a min, you know minimal budgets and and so they take on you know free work and that sort of thing and but and you can come in as a 
an assistant to a, an exec over at a production company. So if our if our goal is to network, if you remember, um, let me come back to this image here. So it's it's all about networking. And so if I am an assistant right here on Jerry Bruckheimer's desk, then my goal is to create a network. Now, should I, Fletch, should I be trying to become networked with the top agent at CAA if I'm an assistant on Jerry Bruckheimer's desk? They'll never listen to you. They'll never listen to me. No. So I want to become friends with the assistant that's on, you know, the big agent over at CAA's desk. Because if I can create a network and I know that assistant over there and I know an assistant over here at ICM and I know an assistant over here at Endeavor, at William Morris Endeavor, and I maybe I know an assistant over at um, uh, Brigham Taylor's company, I start to build my network of other assistants. And so as I start to build these network of other assistants, my whole goal, if, for instance, I'm working on Jerry Bruckheimer's desk, and it's it's my job to find content, right? If we remember what producers provide, um, where did I have that? Producers provide, sorry, I'm, here it is. Producers pro provide create creative information. So projects, I, I as an assistant, I'm not going to be networking with other assistants over at the agency level who represent writers to know when that writer is going to take out his next script to the studio system. If I as an assistant can know when Jim Hertzfeld, for instance, who wrote uh, Meet the Parents, when he coming in with his next big screenplay if i'm next in there with that assistant that rep the of uh, the agent that represents uh, jim herfeld if i know that assistant i will be on the inside flow of information that jerry Br or uh, jim herfeld a writer is coming out with his next big hit and i'll be talking to that assistant saying, hey when's your boss when is your boss hold on watch let me let me get this right oh hey when is your boss? See, I'm on the phone because that's what you do. You spend all your time on the phone. I'm talking to the assistant over in the of the agent that represents Jim Hertzfeld. And I'm saying, hey, when's Jim coming out with his next screenplay? And he says, well, don't tell anybody. OK, I won't tell anybody. Yeah, right. That he's coming out with it next week. And I say, hey, assistant friend of mine that you're in my network and I've been spending lots of time with you on the phone. And you like me. We even went to dinner one night. So I built that relationship. And, and I say, hey, do you mind slipping it to me a day early? Because I want to read it before anyone else in town reads it. Because I want to get it to my boss so that he can buy it. He's a big fan of Jim Hersfeld. If you recall, my boss produced Meet the Parents. So Jim likes my boss. And Steven Spielberg loves Jim Hersfeld. So I'm the best office to send that creative piece of material because I have an in. Does that make sense? So thank you for sending me that screenplay. Okay, so back to our our <laughs> our formula here. So I have um uh, get me back to the producer track here. These all of these assistants at different Various studios, various agencies, various production companies start to become my network. So if, and this is the one thing that I can't stress more. If I'm an assistant and I am on, I don't know, maybe even a no-name producer, but I'm kind of in the system. My boss is kind of a no-name producer. But I have a network of mm. other assistants all over town. Guess what? 
those assistants eventually will get promoted. And it's and usually they, pretty fast. The turnover rate's pretty high. Turnover rate's pretty high. So you always, whenever you're talking to other assistants, man, you got to give, I don't care if they're at some podunk producing production company, you treat them like they're going to be the next Jerry Bruckheimer because they very well might become the very next Jerry Bruckheimer. <clears throat> and guess what? If you're an assistant still, because you're a little bit slower in, in making that jump to, you know, executive or whatever, if your buddy just becomes Jerry Bruckheimer, guess what? He might be hiring junior assist, junior executives and, you know, or you just know a, 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 the next Jerry Bruckheimer. And so your network starts to rise. Now, here's the mistake that a lot of students make when they come into business. And I kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, but a lot of people will come out of college and try to go and network like, OK, I love Ron Howard movies, love them. I want to work yeah. for Ron Howard. So they pick up the phone and they try. Yeah, I'm going to pick up the phone again. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Is this uh, is this Ron Howard's office? Yes, this is the assistant to Ron Howard. Hi, assistant. You're not that important to me. I would like to talk to Ron Howard because I'm out of the business. I have no, you know, no credits, nothing. But I am important. I'm one. Of uh, I'm one hey! And they just hang up on you. <laughs> they hang up on you, right? So your goal isn't to meet Ron Howard. Your goal should be to get to know the assistant to Ron Howard because, or anyone lower than that. I don't know, the mail, mail guy. Um, you're probably not talking to the mail guy on the phone. But so you, a, a lot of kids will come out of high school or out of college and, and, and trying to build those relationships at a level that's just, it's just not reality. And, you know, they may bump into Ron Howard at some function and talk to him and think, I made it. I got it. I talked to him. He's not going to remember you the next day. He's he's not going to know who you are. He's not going to remember your name because you have no value in this whole formula of everything that's moving around. Right. You don't you don't have any value in the clout within, you know, within this, the, the Hollywood leverage, you don't have leverage. And so if you don't have leverage for Ron Howard, Ron Howard has no, no reason to continue to build that network with you because you don't really offer anything. But if you're talking to Ron Howard's assistant and that assistant is overworked, and you find out he's looking for interns, free interns, and you've called him a few times and whatever, and you say, hey, I, I'm just, I'm graduating from uh, Chapman University. I was gonna say USC, but I'd like to pick something else. Or I'm, t I'm graduating for, from Oklahoma University, and, um, and, and I'm looking for internships, and I'll work for free. And that, in, that, that assistant is overworked, probably underpaid and needs help and he's more than happy to have you come in as an intern and be an intern and then when that assistant gets promoted to be a junior exec with ron howard guess where you're sitting and guess what line you're in to get that assistant job in ron howard's office you're next in line because you're the assistant there might be other you're you're i mean so you're the intern there might be other assistants or other people outside of that whole bubble, but you're you're on the inside and you're you're the next one to be plucked out to be an assistant, even though you're an intern and you want to become a producer, but you're climbing that ladder. And um, and so that's uh, that's that's really the most common mistake I see as as you know, young filmmakers are coming out of college. It's not bad to set your sights high. I think you want to know where you want to get to, but then start at the bottom, right? Okay, so let's go back. So that kind of gives you an overview of a producer, like being a producer breaking into the business. Now, 
I'm trying to race through. I didn't do too bad on that one, Fletch. That was 30 minutes and I cranked through it. Okay. So now let's talk about writers. So you know the system already. You already know who the who you know who the players are. You know the leverage points, uh, and you know you know there's producers, agents, and studio ex or studios. So now let's talk about it from the perspective of writers. Okay. So where are the writers represented? Do we all remember? By which 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 of the the game the Hollywood leveraged tr uh, trifecta, it's the agents, right? So the agents are the ones that represent writers and directors and actors. So that's our target, right? If I'm a if I'm a writer and I want to get into an agent, um, that's my that's that's my path, and I want to get to I, I want to get an agent to represent me as a writer and take my screenplays and schlep my screenplays into the system to Jerry Bruckheimer. Okay. So here's the bad news. There's probably a hundred thousand non-working writers out there. So cool. you are one of a hundred thousand. So hey, just be thankful you're not an actor. Yeah, actors are probably one in a million. <laughs> That's where the phrase probably comes from. You are one in a million. Um, but so how, how in the world, if we are a writer and we're writing our screenplays, we wrote two at college while we were taking our college courses. How in the world do we get above the fray of 100,000 hungry writers trying to get out there and get their screenplay seen it's almost impossible but writers yeah, and remember i think it's important to point out you're not talking like you're you're writing against people who don't know what they're doing at this level these hundred thousand writers are pretty decent oh they're, the closer you get to the top they get really good they get really good so you your goal is that you got to get above the fray somehow you got to get noticed somehow you you know someone's got to read your screenplay and say oh my goodness that's awesome so guess what we're going to do we're coming out of college we're going to print off fifty thousand copies of the script and we're going to send it to every agent in the book right no that's not it that's not how you do it they're no, not going to pay idea. attention your screenplay is going to get tossed in the trash. I was looking for a screenplay and I was dramatically, I was going to dramatically <laughs> toss in the trash, but I couldn't, I don't have one close enough to me. I just got several of them I could throw in the trash. Yes. So they're just going to toss it. They're going to throw it out. So, okay. So how do we do it? The agents are the ones that we want to get to. How do we get in there? So here we go. There's a hundred thousand screenplays. Fortunately for the, screenwriters there are some paths to get that um to get all those to get all of those writers distilled down into so that you're the drop that comes out the bottom of the distillery that's a pretty good don't you think that's that's a good one huh that's i just good. made that's, that up i just I'll, came up with that okay so we got to figure out fortunately for writers there's there are it's the least expensive path to success, in my opinion, because it doesn't take money. It it's takes only just you. time. What's that, Fletch? It's only you. It's you. If you want to be a director, you got to direct a movie. You got to hire actors. You got to find a team. You got to get a camera. It's more expensive. Writing, there's just you. Okay. So there are ways to distill down that hundred thousand so we're gonna we're gonna go to the distillery <laughs> and by the time we get done we're gonna have a nice glass of i was trying to think of a really strong vo uh alcohol vodka right okay how purified water purified water there you go well that doesn't get buddy i know but water doesn't really get any distilled down to <laughs> anyway okay so you have a couple of options we talked about 
submitting your scripts cold, that's a bad idea. You can get referred in, okay? So yep. you have a buddy that's a writer, an established writer in the business. He could refer you to his agent, okay? That's not a bad idea. Right. Relationships. Your uncle is Uncle Spielberg, okay? That's a good one, by the way. If anyone is actually the um, uh, the nephew to Uncle Spielberg, I I would desperately like to take you to, to dinner. Yes, so you have relationships, and, and uh, Fletch is ready to take you to dinner. <laughs> so, um, so you've got relationships, you know, it, or... Or, you know, it, it may not, it's not, maybe not Uncle Spielberg, but it's, you know, um, someone that you know is working over at uh, an agency or something like that. So there's, there's that. There are Feb's festivals. So there are festivals that take on screen, screenplays. Um, there are websites that will read screenplays. Some of them charge money. I would be careful. I would, you know, if I'm going to a website to have them look at my, um, to look at my screen, they're going to be awesome, read it, see their success of getting uh, right in the business, look at the, who they are and what their pedigree, do they really have connections? Um, it's, a lot of those would be a bit false, it's a bit false. My favorite one are screenwriting contests. Yeah. When I was when I was at DreamWorks and I was a lowly assistant, uh, one of my jobs was to comb and watch all of the screenplay contests. And and I would watch and the number one contests, the number one screenplay winners, I would get in contact with them and try and set up a meeting for my boss to um, meet that young aspiring screenwriter that just won a contest now why am i going to the contest because that contest has already distilled down probably three thousand screenplays to one winter winner not one winter but to one winner so <laughs> they it's distilled down so now I don't have to read 3,000 screenplays. I read one or I read two runner up, you know, first and second place. So I'll read two right. screenplays and that guy's going to get a meeting with me over at a studio or an agency. So throughout all of these sort of paths, pathways in, my favorite is contests because if you're good, you'll win. If you're not, you'll lose and you'll write more screenplays. And you'll get better, and then you'll eventually win if you keep trying. And so that will, I, I, will you know, I mean, you're gonna, they'll also give you the runner-ups on those, so you don't have to be like, well, I'll just look at the top one. You know, if you sure. make the top ten, you probably stand a chance of getting seen by some people. Absolutely. Well, because the the number one guy is getting is getting picked off by the majors that's right and the big agencies you know the five the four that i showed you earlier but the the eighth place or seventh place or fifth place is getting picked up by the mini major getting pay attention by the mini majors and by the you know lower agents so what look, what are the what are the contests in case they, they ask what are the contests that that are something that they should look at you know, uh, there's there are a few out there, um, like the Nichols Fellowship um, Screenwriting Contest, which I haven't looked at in the last year or so uh, to, to know that it's still around. I would assume it's still around because it's put on by the Academy. And so that is one that's done, you know, by the Oscars, so to speak. Um, I think that's correct, the Nichols Fellowship. But there's there are other contests out there. Um, like the Sundance Institute has a screenwriting contest. Um, I mean, you can literally, you can do a search on the web for screenwriting contests and, and really kind of look um, um, who's associated with them, how big they are, how long they've been around, and, and you can kind of really tell, okay, these are, these are top ranking screenwriting contests. Um, and, but that's, that's the direction I would go if I was a writer. So finishing off the distillery, 
So 10 of these 100,000 make it to the agents. And then the agents, just like in our graphic before, are sending those writers out to the Jerry Bruckheimers of the world, the producers, because they have open writing assignments. And they're getting it to, you know, Jerry Bruckheimer to, um, for his open writing assignment. Or, you know, it may just be, hey, an agent calls Jerry Bruckheimer, says, hey, I've, I just signed this new writer. He's amazing. You don't really have any open writing assignments, but I want you to just read a writing sample of his because you're really going to like him. We have an opening and a need for him. You're going to want him. So that agent will send your screenplay into Jerry Bruckheimer. Or... You may have a script that you've written, a spec script. And when those spec scripts go out to the agents, just like I'd mentioned before, the Jim Hertzfeld <clears throat> new screenplay going out on town, going out to town, your script could be going out to producers all around town. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, every studio, as I mentioned before, has a bunch of producers that represent it. An agent will submit your spec screenplay to one of those producers uh, re that rep that are represented at that studio. And I think so, it's important to note here that the that the agents, <clears throat> and this is very kind of hush hush conversations, but those agents know what those studios are looking for. Yes, and they're not going to take a script to a place where they're not looking for westerns here over at Paramount right now. But I know. That, uh, that Disney's looking for one. So let's go over there. So they, they know what people are looking for. They do. They know exactly what they're looking for. What kind of writer? That's why I was saying the writing sample, <clears throat> you know, you have, you've written a Western, and they've got a, a Western that they've already got a screenplay for it, so they're not interested in buying your Western. But if you have a good voice in the Western genre, your agent will send it over to that studio. And so <clears throat> the, the studios and the, in sort of the system, all of these, let me just find it back here. These are the content drivers, right? So these, this is the bank, if you remember. Every one of these studios has projects that they're working on. And every one of these studios has all of those producers around it. And so an agent will be submitting their screenplay to this studio, to that studio, to this, to this, to this, right? Through relationships that are had within the networks that we talked about earlier. So <clears throat> that's why it's important those networks, if you're coming in as an assistant, that you get to know, and, you know, other assistants at different places so that you have, a, you know, a connection at all the different studios back to our list here back to our, our presentation here so so every producer will receive eight or so screenplays whether it's specs or writing assignments or, or writing samples they'll send in i don't know one two three six into the studio and then the studio buys your idea or buys your um, hires you for the writing, open writing assignment, or what have you. The one thing that doesn't work, which we've already talked about, is the unsolicited. Everybody has a policy that they don't take unsolicited material. So you gotta, you gotta get yourself into that system through one of these channels that really gets you on the inside. Not easy. It's not going to be easy, but. It, none of it's, you know, none of it. getting into this business. If you're looking for easy, Fletch, I think this is the business, right? If, you, if you're looking for an easy way in, this is the one. You know, I mean, it's this or you can become a janitor. That's, I mean, they're kind of comparative <laughs> when it comes to difficulty and getting the job. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard to get in. So it's, it's, it's a fight to get in. And so you got to find the right, the path to go in. Um, and, you know, the last piece of advice that I would really give to all those as they're trying to make their way into the business is one is they have to be, you got to be humble, man. 
you got to be humble and willing to just work at it. Be persistent, right? If you eat a lot of garbage, I mean, uh, when you first get started, you're going to be asked to, you know, get me that donut, pull that chair over here. Can you run this to the printer? Can you run this over to Paramount? I mean, you're asked to do jobs that normally you would think, oh, this is beneath me. Uh, I don't need this. But uh, in truth, they have a line a mile long of people who are willing to do this for free to get in. Right. So it's got to be, I think, that humility and being easy to work with, you know. When somebody says or asks you to do something, you need to say, okay, I can do that. I mean, if, unless it's against your moral code or something. Yeah, uh, don't, uh, don't break, break up, you know, your ground. But um, it's, it's important to be able to be easy to work with. Yeah, and, and work hard. You know, when you finally get to bring that donut from the craft service to the office, get it there as fast as you can, right? And oh, yeah. Don't deal with Allie. Bring it with the right sprinkles on it, you know? <laughs> Don't bring a donut that has a bite out of it because you got hungry halfway through. <clears throat> Be, get there. Be persistent, you know? It's, it's a tough thing getting in. You want to be persistent, but not, you know, you don't want to stock these people. But be persistent, you know, you, you place a phone call to the assistant and then you a week later you follow up or a few days later you follow up and then. You know, another another, another uh, trait that I've noticed is, is handy and I'm not good at it, is being short and to the point. Because a lot of these people do not have the time to be able yeah. to sit and chit chat with you for the next 45 minutes. Um, it, it needs to be quick, to the point. And there will be other times when you're out at a party or getting drinks or at a screening where you can chit chat with people. But when you're doing the job, you need to do the job and move on and, uh, and come back later, circle back and foster that relationship in another way. Yep, for sure. I mean, if you're looking at like the base level where we're all assistants, the other assistants don't have a ton of time because they're going crazy. But when you when you call them, you you call them by name. It's just these little things. It's like, hey Fletch, hey, I've got my boss for your boss, and they're like, oh man, he said my, he said my name, and that's it. Yeah. That's the interaction. And you know, I think that works. I think that works with everybody, whether you're on uh, a crew. Uh, the first show I ever directed, my director of photography gave me a pen. He said, now we have, we were directing about fourteen different kids, young kids. And he said, as you meet them, write them their names down on your hand because you'll get this all the time. But you'll be able to direct them better if you call them by their name and they will respond to you much better than, hey, kid, do this. Right. So learn people's names. Absolutely. Teachers so, are all good at this because you learn hundreds of kids' names every semester. Yeah. So if you're writer, a writer, write screenplays. Write, write, write. If you're a director, direct, 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 direct. And if you're an actor, you're acting, you just keep acting. And, you know, if the you, directors is a very similar process, man. There are, it's a little more expensive, but it's very similar. There are, you know, contests, there's festivals, relationships you can kind of go through the same process to kind of break into the business but you just got to do it and you got to be good at it you know i i think chad i gotta i gotta say i think it's like once you've made a movie and it is actually good i think it's a lot easier than a writer breaking in if you yes. make a movie that's good i mean that's really good it will get passed around so someone will could, say no, this is great and they'll pass it around to somebody else and a, a week will go by or a month, and then suddenly somebody at the studio gets their hands on it from a link that somebody put on Vimeo. And before you know it, somebody from the big world is calling you going, hey, I just saw your little film. That was really good. Yes. Well, and it's, the script is a little different. It's, it's harder. It's to, you still have to read. You have to interpret. Yeah. You have to pour through the pages. And, and then it's hard to share that with somebody over at another studio, you know, and then they have to sit down and read it and it takes time. Yeah, that's true. Very true. It's more expensive, but it's more viral. Yeah. <clears throat> Meaning it can get, it's, it's easy for somebody to just watch a link for five minutes and go, oh my gosh, that was great. Versus reading a screenplay for an hour and a half, 
two hours. So yeah, it's a little more expensive, but it, it can be easier to sort of be, get, get a visual and be seen. Well, that's... Do you, I, got, I got one more thing since we have a little time. We have 10 okay. minutes. Okay, go ahead. I want to hear your story about how you broke into the studio system. I, all right. I, I'll have to distill it down because it's... Right, uh, right, right. Don't, it, don't give me uh, soup to nuts. Just give me uh, a couple of the uh, crackers. A couple of the highlights? Well, my... I mean, first of all... So... I think what's most important in my story is I had a goal and I knew where I wanted to go, right? So I wanted to be at Amblin, um, at DreamWorks, which was in the Amblin facility in feature development. So I knew that's where I wanted to be. And, um, and so I was doing everything, trying to figure out every way to get to the bottom level job in that in that position, in that in that company. And so before I jump into it, the one thing I would say is that if you want to be a producer, don't take a job at Disney in the business affairs department, right? Don't, that's probably the bottom, you know, it's not a bad place to start, but it's, it, you got to jump over ladders to get to feature development or in producing. Well, I think that a good example of this, what you're talking about is when you were working at DreamWorks and you weren't in the department that you wanted to be. And re I remember getting a call from you and you were like, dude, they just offered me a job for a lot of money over at DreamWorks Music. Yep. And do I take it? I'm like, well, do you want to be a producer of music? And he said, no. I said, well, I think you have your answer. Yeah. And I, I had a few of those in those early days of like trying to find a job. It was I got an, I got a job offer over at Disney and Business Affairs that I turned down. DreamWorks Music. I got a job offer in DreamWorks Marketing um, and I turned those down. But um, the short and sweet of my job was as I, as I figured out where I wanted to be, which was Amblin DreamWorks. I did everything possible to get some informational interviews. I ended up getting into human resources over at DreamWorks, uh, yet they didn't really, they, I was, they thought I was, you know, I was young, nobody's going to hire me. So that was kind of a bust. And so I figured out, I figured out who was, where were they hiring their temps? So you have assistants, and then you have mailroom, and then even below that you have temps, um, and then you have the dog kennel, and, and <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty at the bottom. But I, I figured out what was the temp agency that was hire that DreamWorks was using to hire. I went over to the temp agency and tried to get a job there, and I wasn't qualified. I mean, imagine that. I didn't know, I didn't know Excel. I didn't know, you know. My, Microsoft Word well enough. I took all these tests and I like failed them miserably. So I wasn't even I wasn't even qualified to be a temp. <laughs> so they do have dog walkers now. I mean, maybe that's I know. Uh, more your so, speed. So I went back to the human resources person who wasn't really excited to talk to me, and I was being persistent, maybe a little too persistent in following up. And I said to her, I said. I will never call you again <laughs> if, if you will give me a recommendation over at London Temps. And because London Temps was the company that was putting jobs into DreamWorks. And she said, absolutely. Now, <laughs> I had did, just been to London. Back? I had just been to London Temps and failed all their tests, by the way. And so this head of human resources calls over to London Temps and says, hey, I want you to take a look at a guy. I'd like you to take a look at a guy, Chet Thomas. And I'm sure they're thinking, oh, we've seen him. But, but because, <laughs> the, because the head of human resources was calling, they were like, absolutely, because she's the one that hires. And their assumption was, oh, DreamWorks head of human resources likes this guy named Chet Thomas. So we're going to bring him in, which they did. They trained me on all these programs and got me qualified. 
then started sending me out to jobs and started sending me to the DreamWorks jobs because they thought that the DreamWorks jobs were the ones that they wanted me for. And it, long story short, after being in that pool for like three months, I get called to do a job. Well, there were two jobs available. There was one that was a possibility over at Amblin for one day. And I'm like, that's the one. Send me to that one. Sign me up. And they're like, well, relax. It's not for sure yet. And there's one other job. It's like a five day job over in the Texaco building, which was not Amblin. It wasn't Dream. It was DreamWorks. It's still but, it was, but, but, it's, but it was it's corporate. It shop. was it was something other than feature development. So I said, I don't really want that one. And they're like, Chet, we don't. It's five days and it's for sure. And I'm like, I'd rather have the one day that's not for sure. And they're like, and it makes no sense. So like they hung up and they're like, I don't get this guy, but whatever. But like an hour later, they call me back and they say, Chet, you have to take the five day job. And I'm like, but I don't want the five day job. And they're like, it's it's five days. The other one, the other one's maybe one. And I'm like, you guys can keep my check. I don't care. And they're like, are you crazy? And I'm like, that's just what I want. And then they just said, no, you have to take this job. So I was like, okay. So I took the job. Guess where it was? It was over in the Texaco building working in the office of the head of human resources. <laughs> <laughs> they had me back in this little office. The head wasn't in yet. And I was like, okay, I know she comes in at 10. I'm going to go fake file out right by the opening area. You know? <laughs> Fake file. So I was fake filing out by where I knew she would come in. And she walks in and she sees me and she goes, like, like she looks at me like she's seen a ghost and says, looks at me and she goes, What are you doing here? And I was like, You guys, you guys brought me in for a temp job. She's like, Oh, okay. And then she went into her office. What and then are I, you doing here? <laughs> and then I left my fake filing job to go back to the real filing job. And then I was just working and like an hour later, she came into my office and sat down on the desk and she said, Chet, where do you want to be at Dreamer? And I said, Amblin. And she goes, okay, let me, let me go look at Brown. She goes out, comes back like 20 minutes later and she says, okay, there's a job over at Amblin, but it's an indefinite temp job. And I said, sign me up, I'm in. And that's where it started. Yeah. That is my story. I, I, I boiled it down in an hour long story. Yeah, you took all the, the G tidbits. That was good. Yeah, so anyway. Well, folks. Well, no one's asked any questions, so you must have covered everything really, I really well. I covered it all, man. That is, that is my story. Is story. I'm just looking at the <laughs> chat here. Oh, uh, somebody said, so this is how you sneak on the lot. Yeah, that's exactly how you do sneak on the exactly lot. exactly how it's done. Well, that's what Steven did, right? That's why we call ourselves sneak on the lot. Yeah, and I did sneak back on the lot a couple times. So we won't talk about that. So, All right, so I think that wraps it up since there's no uh, no questions for tonight. Um, so this will be, uh, be on the site uh, very shortly. And probably the next hour, we'll get this up. And you can use it in your classrooms tomorrow. Thanks for coming, guys. We'll see you later.